for recent work. The title is the Universal Thermodynamic Bounds on Symmetry Breaking in Living Systems. Before, before we talk about the bounds, we need to understand what, what we talk about, about what we mean by symmetry breaking. So in living systems, there are different forms of symmetry breaking. One example is the kinetic freeing. So in biochemical systems, in many times, uh, it need always need to uh, dis uh, discriminate different molecules. For example, in immune systems, the living system need to recognize the antigen in uh, in the copy of DNA and RNA. The enzymes need to di discriminate the right and wrong monomers to add to the DNA and RNA. However, if we only discriminate these molecules by their ener energy difference, the error rate is too high. So Hopfield introduced this kind of kinetic proof model, which used some energy to maintain a non-equilibrium sta stationary state so that the error rate is dramatically reduced. So this is the kind of symmetry breaking in the chemical space that the, ener the energetic symmetry is broken. So another example of symmetry breaking is the pattern formation. So uh, which is also quite common in biosystems. We can see different patterns on animal skin. Also, it's important for the cell division. So this kind of pattern formation is also, also out of equilibrium and, and highly nonlinear. And due to the nonlinear nature and the out of equilibrium driving force, we can show some special pa spatial pattern emerges from uniform distribution. So these two different symmetry breaking are uh, have uh, ha still have some similarities. The the common thing is that. Both of them need energy injection. They need to consume some energy to break this kind of symmetry. So what we want to answer is that, can we say something more general to unify all these different symmetry breaking mechanisms in a, in a unified scope? So before we talk about the, the unified bounds or the cost to break symmetries, we, need to, we first need to write down everything in a thermodynamically consistent way. So what helps us to for uh, to write thermodynamic consistent time evolution is the local data balance relation. The local data balance relation tells us for transitions in biochemical systems. Uh, for example, here we have an H. An H. So the forward transition divided by the backward transition rates should satisfy the local data balance relation, which is give, uh, determined by the energy difference and the drawing force along that H. And when, when is the system out of equilibrium? It's out of equilibrium when we can find a cycle and uh, the, the thermodynamic affinity to find on a, a cycle is not zero. So in this case, it was a system out of equilibrium. So, but a uh, master equation, which is linear, is not enough to describe a nonlinear symmetry breaking. So here we want to introduce a nonlinear rate equation, which can characterize the nonlinear nature of symmetry breaking, for example, the pattern formation. So the form of this kind of nonlinear rate equation is still similar to master equation, but the transition rates here are nonlinear, and uh, there are some prefactors, omega ijp. So this nonlinear factor should be understood as uh, catalytic mechanisms. So we can these catalytic terms, for example, the autocatalytic reaction, we should have this kind of term, which can make system nonlinear, but still have this, this kind of master equation form. Uh, this catalytic term. Uh, it's very good because the local data balance, balance relation still holds. And if we take a ratio of these two, uh, of the forward and the backward rates, we will see that this, uh, this uh, nonlinear term cancels. And we only, we only have a linear term which still satisfy the detailed balance relation. So as I just mentioned, we can understand the non-equilibrium nature from the cycle affinity. But here I want to go back to the uh, pathway interpretation of non-equilibrium system, and we can see how can we construct cycle from the reaction pathways. So in a chemical reaction network, for example, here we have state I and state J. So we, if a network is very complex, we can define multiple reaction pathways in the network. We can find many pathways. And along each pathway, we can find the equilibrium constant of, of that pathway. So how to understand the equilibrium constant? This equilibrium constant is that if we think the pathway is very fast and this pathway dominates the reaction and all pathways are very slow, then we can get the ratio of these two states, the, pro the population on these two states, reach the, the corresponding equilibrium states determined by the chosen pathway. 
and which and the equilibrium constant is defined as the product of all the forward rates divided by the backward rates along the pathway, and it is related to the thermodynamic forces in the form of the energy difference between these two states and the driving force along that pathway. So for a general for a network, we if it's complex, we can always define many pathways, and uh, each pathway can give us a, an equilibrium constant, which only determined by the thermodynamic property of that pathway, not not related to the kinetic details of that pathway. And so that different pathways may have different equilibrium constants. So that if we find the two pathways with different equilibrium constants, then we can combine them together to form a cycle. Then the cycle affinity is non is non-zero. So the system is out of equilibrium. But apart from the cycle affinity, the pathway itself tells us a lot of a lot of information. So we can find we can maximize and minimize over all the equilibrium constants identified in all reaction pathways. And uh, intuitively, we can understand that we can think that if we find finally, if a system reach a equilibrium state, uh, a stationary state, this stationary state should be bounded by the maximal equilibrium constant from all pathways and the minimal equilibrium constant also minimized over all pathways. So which these two bounds define a non-equilibrium phase space in the space expanded by the probabilities so yes, we can understand this bound by intuition, but also we show in our uh, preprint, we can have a rigorous proof based on the matrix tree theorems. So while uh, the benefit of matrix tree theorem is that we can decompose a uh, stationary state in terms of all spanning trees. And because a spanning tree don't have any cycles, so it represents the equilibrium properties of a system. And this is slightly different from the uh, the master equation here. The system is nonlinear, so the direct expansion tree also in, ha, also has the part which depends on the system is, the, itself. But still, finally, we can cancel all the nonlinear term and found this bound. Then, what I want to talk about two applications. The first one is the kinetic breeding. So, in kinetic breeding, so if the system uh, the system is uh, driven, we have some cycle and system is driven out of equilibrium. If a system don't have this driving force, if we cut these two red edges, so we the discrimination will go back to the energetic discrimination. The error rate is too high for real to for real biological systems. Uh, and Hope Field introduced this kinetic breeding scheme. So we have this cycle which use energy to improve the error rate to, to lower the error rate. Uh, in Hope Field scheme, so the Drawing for the this kind of uh, external driving um, transitions is unidirectional, so which means that the energy consumption is infinitely far, infinitely large. However, the error the error rate is still finite because due to some kinetic constraints in the proof reading network, there are some symmetries in in the kinetics. If we lose all the kinetic constraints, we should be able to find the, the thermodynamic bound of the error rate. So here, using our um, reaction pathway argument, we can see that there is a lower bound and an upper bound of the error rate. The lower bound of the error rate is found when the when we found the reaction pathway, which uses the drawing force to push the wrong state to the right state. And the upper bound, which means that we, we use the energy in a wrong way, which push the right state to a wrong state. So here we get the upper and lower bound directly from the thermodynamic property of a system and we don't have any kinetic constraints. And uh, here we can fix the delta mu and uh, optimize uh, and randomly choose the kinetic parameters. And we can, found, we can find that the error rate is well bounded by this upper and lower bound. So these two bounds are not uh, entirely new. So they have been found in these two papers. Uh, but here, our reaction pathway interpretation, I think it's very intuitive and uh, can help people to understand what really happened here. And also in a more complex proof reading network, the system is very complex and we don't know all the kinetic details, but we can determine the thermodynamic bound solely from the thermodynamic properties. We can find all reaction pathways and we know the thermodynamics of all reaction pathways. And then we know the upper and lower bound of the, of the error rate or the accuracy of a system. Another more in interesting example is the bound on pattern contrast or the, the reactive pattern. So when we see a reactive pattern, we can see a lot of interesting properties. And the one observable is the contrast of pattern or the visibility. For example, here we can see two different patterns and the one with low contrast and the one with high contrast. How do we define this kind of contrast? 
So we have a very conventional way in optics, and also we can borrow that definition here. The contrast is defined as the maximal uh, concentration minus the minimal concentration, which is the range of the concentration, and divided by a sum of the maximal and the minimal concentration. This contrast, using our approach, we can show that this contrast is smaller or equal to the tension of the injection energy. So with a finite amount of energy injected to the system, we can only achieve, uh, we have an upper bound of the contrast. And we can do simulations of this kind of 2D pattern and say the pattern visibility is well bounded by this upper thermodynamic upper bound. I want to show how, how we get this bound. So thanks to the face-based geometry method developed by uh, in this paper, it's from a reinforced group. Uh, this approach is very nice because this approach allows us to study the properties of reaction diffusion pattern using the geometry of the face space, the space expanded by these the two concentrations. So for a reaction diffusion system, we can always write it in forms of uh, diffusion terms and uh, plus our reaction terms. And Just mentioning have... that we are already in the time for questions. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I will go through the rest quickly. We have, we can, the reactive loop lines is uh, the reaction zero line. And also we can have another conserved quantity, which is the flux balance subspace. The intersection of the flux balance subspace and the reactive loop lines uh, tells us the minimum and the maximum concentration of the stationary pattern. But here, what not answered is where is the non equilibrium nature of the system? So what we tell is that we can define the non equilibrium phase space and all the all the reactive, uh, the reactive loop line must lie inside the non equilibrium phase space. And we can have an example. We have a uh, nonlinear systems, and we can have the the two boundaries contributed from these two reaction pathways, and uh, the intersection of flux band subspace and uh, the two boundaries defines a thermodynamic bound. And uh, we can see for one D pattern, and we get a thermodynamic bound of the concentration, and then immediately we can get a bound on the contrast of pattern, and we get we can do simulation to as a uh, numerical verification. And finally, as uh, some uh, to the take home message is that we can understand the bound in two ways. The first, the first way is that uh, if we know if we know the driving force inside the system, then we know accessible chemical the phase space, the, the accessible non equilibrium phase space. The other interpretation is that if we want to design some certain biological functional system, for example, we want to have multiple stationary state, we want to have a pattern with certain contrast, we want to have a bistable state, and we then all these stationary state will occupy a finite space in the phase space. And uh, the non-equilibrium phase space must be larger than this space, the space be occupied by the non-equilibrium stationary states so that we know we will know the minimal energetic cost to design the desired symmetry breaking system. So finally, thanks to my supervisors and our work, is, uh, our, prepare, our preprint is already on archive, so you can check all the details. So that's all, yeah, thanks. Thank you for the interesting talk. We have time for one question, I'm afraid. So uh, anyone, any one of the students or postdocs want to ask a question? If not, then I've seen that Tom has some, something to say. Okay, Tom, maybe you'll... Uh... Ask your question. Can you go back to the kinetic proofreading picture? Yes. Oh, thanks for the talk, by the way. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so here. So 